I gotta get this set up. So this is the phone. So that goes to that. And then this goes to this. You'll have to tell me if this is going to pick up okay. And then what I need then to go into this other one is this. Speakers on, no things, you're not coming out of it. Yeah, it's now it is. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you USB. We'll just put it on the chair. Maybe not right there. We're at this back. Can you hear me? Can you hear it on the Zoom? Testing one, two. You can hear it okay. It picks up pretty much everything. So, you think we need the chair or just set it up here and let the thing? It's probably fine. Just give us a chair. Okay. I mean, I don't know. We just have to get feedback. You see? Yeah. And then I can just mute this with. Now, the way I got it set up is if you stand off to like this side one. Does it stand over here? Because my computer's here. Okay. Then I'll move. Because I'm going to kind of put this this way. Yeah, that's right. Can you tell me how to move this? How do you move this? Um, you can move it off. Yeah. 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 
I guess it's uh, seven o'clock. Everybody's busy talking, chatting. Yeah. You got everything from merchandise tonight. Okay. All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started. What's that? Let's, uh, if you guys can, uh, we'll try to get done with this, then we can visit afterwards, or if we have questions and stuff, we'll get started. Nice to see a few of us brave their way here through the the rain, the pouring rain. The Wileys are uh, are out of town this weekend, so uh, the vice president here has to step up and be president today. And as I understand it, the Wileys uh, planned this around the naked bike race. So I guess I don't know if there's some correlation there or what, but uh, there was some talk. Yeah, exactly. Do you have pictures, Gary? It's like, no. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's call the meeting to order, and uh, we'll get rolling. We're just going to kind of keep it casual, and I got a little presentation here at the end and stuff. We'll go over and stuff. So just a quick, uh, we're going to go through our general meeting, the agenda real quick. Um, just a few announcements. Um, so our July meeting is going to be out at uh, Cherry City Honey out there at Gary and Tammy Wiley's. Um, the uh, first, our, that first Monday is the 4th of July. So I don't think we're going to have good attendance if we try to have it on the 4th. So we're going to have it on that Saturday at the 9th. It's going to be at 10 a.m. at the Cherry City Honey. We're going to do rendering beeswax. Um, we've got a couple of people up there going to display their, uh, their techniques. Um, and I think, do you have a sign-up sheet? Yeah. yeah. Just to kind of give us a rough idea yeah, how many are going to be there. Truly an RSVP. It's just so that we know we have enough supplies there for everybody. Because it's going to be like a hands-on thing, so we kind of want to make sure we got enough stuff there for everybody. Has everybody signed in for tonight? Everybody signed in. August meeting here. August meeting is going to be August first. That is also going to be out at Cherry City Honey. That's going to be that first Monday. That'll be kind of a regular 7 p.m. time. We don't have a specific topic, but kind of what we tossed around doing is a uh, kind of some more hands-on demonstrations and stuff like marking queens, um, different techniques that are used to mark them, what we mark them with, um, alcohol washes, the procedure and how you do that to check for your varroa mites. And um, if there's any other procedures that you guys would like some hands-on experience to, to kind of share and how we, uh, how we do things, uh, please let us know, or if there's a topic you want to hear about, it's going to be pretty well uh, like a round table and open discussion. And if anybody has it, just email one of us or, or give us a jingle or text us. Um, the summer meeting is going to be our summer picnic, and that will be Sunday, September 11th, and we're going to have that out at, at my farm. Um, we're going to start that around noon, um, bring a covered dish to share and swimming suits. Um, the club will provide meat, drinks, and the tableware and stuff. So just come and um, enjoy yourself. And um, usually a pretty good time. And usually there's plenty of food, that's for sure. Um, any other announcements before we get into the, the meat of the things? Yeah, Evelyn. Uh, I'm thinking about the answer to the movies for oh, yeah. tonight. Um, I'm part of the sports game. So great job. Also, I was going to make an announcement too of all the different um, uh, presentations that were done this month. We've had a lot of people pretty busy here in May. I know Kim and Gary and Tammy, and 
I'm sure there was some others. Sue Rose. Sue Rose. Jamie Garza. Um, we did presentations at the Fremont Library, um, United Methodist uh, Church of Bellevue, Blind Village Pioneer Days. Um, that was with uh, fourth graders, was it? Um, there was quite a few students with that. The Garden Club met out at Cherry City as well. We're having, there's another Pioneers Day out at the Lime, um, Lime Village on September 9th. And Kim, if you could give details on what you're looking for on that. Yeah, we might actually have um, everyone signed up for it. Um, I'm just using your table here. Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, Lime Village does put on Pioneer Days in September. It's a Friday, a Saturday, and Sunday. Friday, um, they bring in fourth graders. From what I understand, there's going to be 450 to 600 fourth graders there. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday are public visiting days. Um, and so the way it works, just real quick, they have 60 stations and not 60 different topics, but we're going to provide two people to go and speak. So when the kids rotate from station to station, they're not gonna go to the B station twice. They just go once because some others are doubled up in that 60. So we're gonna have two people go. Right now, we do have two people who have volunteered to do that. Um, so unless if it doesn't work out, I can get back with you. But what I do wanna talk about, we put together a presentation box. And really, this is what it is. It's actually two of these and a hive. And the idea is that- An empty hive. An empty hive, yeah. yes. <laughs> empty hive. Um, the little first graders, they have bees in there, but um, no, you're not gonna have the bees. But real quick, um, we're trying to do this so it's easy. That you're willing to go and present, and all we have to do is Either I can sometimes go and set things up for you and you just walk in and present and then I go pick up, it's worked out that way. Or we meet up and we give you all the supplies and then it's real easy. Um, but I'm not gonna go through what's in the box, um, but it's basically anything and everything about taking care of bees. Um, it doesn't mean you have to talk about every item, but it's there if you need to. So an example was, I had a little kid ask me, well, how do you catch a queen? Well, at that point, I realized I needed to put a queen catcher in here. So it's still evolving, but um, you've got some things. The, the main thing is there's a notebook, and it will walk you through have some pictures for you to use as visuals. And this is for adults too. I have ordered a set of posters, the big um, photographic um, posters. So we'll have that as well. Um, and then um, there seems like, the, oh, the one thing I'm gonna add is because this coming Monday, I'm gonna go talk um, to the Fremont Life, no, maybe, not the library. Well, it's one of, I've got two presentations I'm going to, but the one I specifically asked to talk a little bit about pollinators. So what I want to do is put together something for the notebook that if somebody wants specifically some pollinator information along with the beekeeping, it's here for you. So it's kind of like a presentation in a box, ready to go. Um, and we just ask that um, you possibly volunteer um, to help do the presentation and that way it'll kind of spread spread it out and make it a little bit easier than just one person, two people going and doing it. So is there any questions? Is the PowerPoint in there? Is there a PowerPoint um, with that? The PowerPoint is not in here. Not in there there sure. to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right now I've not done anything electronic with PowerPoints and presentations, mainly because what I've been doing on little kids, and they like the, the hands-on, be able to see visually. Um, but like Gary, he has done some with the PowerPoint. So we also will have, and I'm glad to mm -hmm. ask, um, ask that, um, we have that added in. But we want to try to make it for little kids all the way up through adults. So.
Okay. Can you tell she's been a school teacher? It <laughs> does kind of leak through a little bit. Um, I do have, if you are a person who is interested in possibly helping out with presentation, I have a paper with that as well for name and contact information um, that if something comes up. So um, thank you so much. That's it. Kind of the idea of this is again, we don't really want necessarily the the executive, uh, the officers of the club being the ones that are only ones out there communicating. All of us have certain connections, but we do want to, as a club, be able to provide you educational material and the supplies that you need to properly, you know, to help you educate a little bit and stuff. So if you need something, um, let us know and uh, we can help kind of furnish that stuff for you as well. Because our whole job here is for education and stuff. So really, this is right up our, our alley. Um, again, the announcements like uh, Linda's here and Evelyn's here. Evelyn's here for Tom's nukes and Evelyn's got nukes. Evelyn also has, um, or I'm sorry, Linda. Where's Linda? Oh, there she is. Linda has nukes coming off. What do you have, five this Wednesday? Five or six nukes, if you know of anybody looking for nukes. And then um, she probably will have some more coming off the following week as well. She's been, you know, Linda, Linda can't let, uh, let anything swarm or let any swarm go. So it's all her uh, hardware is being used up. So it's like uh, anybody uh, looking for nukes, please let her know. I got a nuke from her and it was stuffed full. It was huge. So um, any other announcements, anything else before we go into the, the heart of it? Yeah, that'll be a new, a new business, I think, is where I got it. Secretary's report, anything, Kim? Minutes are sent out last month for last month's meeting, so unless there's corrections or additions. Any additions or corrections to the minutes is printed? If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Good deal, minutes look good. Treasurer's report. Okay. Um, Tammy is not here, but um, in the checking account, there's $6,250.15, and the savings account is still carrying $25. Any questions on the treasurer's report? We couldn't answer them anyways, so. <laughs> <laughs> Committee reports, um, merchandise. Uh, that is Doug and Becky Ritchie and uh, Rosemary Clifford. They've got the... Uh, Tonight is the last night um, for this order that's going in. Um, Rosemary, if you want to, or anybody want to fill us in a little bit of what the duties are. We've got the shirts here, so if you want to double check, check on the side, just say you. And for sure, I'm going to take a picture of them. Look at the orders. You want to try them on and change what your order is. That's fine, but try them on and just make sure they're going to be yeah, it can't be returned and stuff. So we'd like to pull this order together and um, when the Wileys get home, we'll submit it and uh, we'll send a check in for the whole thing. Yes, Becky. Uh, they will order something in in the size to just try it on. Okay. Um, before it's embroidered. Before they embroider it. Okay. He, they said he was talking to benchmarks and he said that you could put on there like 2x large or tall. 2x but, tall. But put on there tall. Okay. And that can be done. So if anybody has extra large sizes, um, you can work right with benchmark or um, yeah, 2x tall. Okay. We'll get that straightened up tonight. Nomination election committee. This is our ongoing committee that Chris is in charge of. Yeah, well, we're still looking for folks to join up or to maybe we could mentor them along. Uh, see what position you're interested in or like to do more. Um, I would say directors are always good. We're always looking for a secretary and a treasurer, you know. Uh, 
or somebody to a vice president who would go into a president's job if to be elected. But uh, if, if uh, the Wileys come on the Zoom, we are going to have to stop and have an nomination for him to become the dictator <laughs> of the club for the rest of his life, and we'll all approve it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, Chris's committee, um, we have to, he's got to get the nominations around and that'll be done at our November meeting. And then the votes will take place at our Christmas meeting there in December and stuff. So um, old business, the only old business I could find was really the merchandise. Um, I believe we're wrapping that up tonight. Is there any other old business, Kim, you can think of at all that? Good enough, new business. So new business is, um, it's this time of year again, and we're going into fair season. And again, the request that we get um, from some of the fairs is, is anybody just do the, does the club wanna be represented at the fairs? Um, and again, we're gonna use the same policy we did last year. If you, if you have a, an association with one of the fairs and you really wanna help out and stuff, we'd like to put kind of one person as our head person that we can go to and talk to. And then um, we'll kind of send everybody towards you to, to head up that fair. Um, right now, I know we got Ottawa, Erie, Sandusky, Seneca, Huron. Is that it? Is there anybody in here right now that is has a certain fair that they would like to head up or um, speak for? And if not, we're gonna be we're going to leave it totally up to the group. It isn't something that the officers are going to take on. Again, we're going to do it the same way we did last year. I think, um, I think Terry maybe did Ottawa County, um, and a couple of us helped out with that. Um, so if you know of a fair or a county that you want to help with, um, we're going to ask that you kind of head that up. And again, those presentation boxes is, can be facilitator used at that as well. And we'll have the posters, um, so you got some visual aids as well and stuff, and a, and a hive. Okay. Nobody wants to quickly volunteer. You know when the fairs are on the intersection? Um, I know when Ottawa is coming up here, the, like the third week in July. Um, I would say kind of stay one that you're geographically close to, um, because you'll be going in and out quite a bit and stuff. So. I could do some Erie County. You'll do Erie County. Evelyn. In the past, what we've done is like Thursday evening, Friday evening. Kim, did you get that for uh, Erie County? Who was it? What your name again? Uh, Jamie. Either Erie or Huron. Oh, okay. Yeah, Erie in August. So, yeah. so you want to do Erie? Or? Sure. Yeah, I do Huron too in August. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Yes. I'll do Sandusky County. Sandusky County? Okay. So we'll kind of shoot people your direction and um, kind of help facilitate that. And then you guys can pull your info together. Chris. Chris. I guess, what are we going to do at the fairs this year? Is it just going to be a table? I remember the last ones we had the observation hive, so to speak, had be, and we had that big tent. Are we planning on doing the big tent again? Mm -hmm. Or the big tent and a table within it? I think that's pretty well going to be up, you know, left to the discretion of the person that's doing it. If you want to have like a little video that loops through, um, we can do that. We have the presentation box. Um, selling honey and honey you can sell honey at them as well. If you're going to be there volunteering, you can sell honey at that booth as well. We've done that in the past. My, um, I have to contact some of the fairs to change the correspondence. Let me go ahead and this week I will contact every county and I'll see what they need from us, what we can take, and maybe it is going to be where we just supply the presentation boxes and then if someone is able to sell honey, they have that option to do that too. Um, we won't have the pet of you though. No. Yeah, we will. Yeah. So, we at Seneca one year, we just had in there like the barn and a table. Yeah. Okay. Most of the time I've just seen a table 
Um, I do have an observation hive. If somebody wanted to uh, to borrow it, I mean, we can we can take it a small one, oh. a tabletop one. <laughs> oh. But as you said, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, is that for all fairs? That's what we've done. Yeah, because most of the time, if you're sitting there like Tuesday, Wednesdays, it's not real. There's not much activity. Not much activity and stuff. I'll find out, and then I'll send an email. Thank you very much for stepping up and helping out like that. We'll uh, we'll shoot people your way, and at least we got somebody that we can kind of head things up with a little bit. Okay. Any other new business? No new other business. Good. Yeah. Okay. So let me go into a little presentation. Let's see if I can get it here. Yeah. What's that? That's Okay. So what I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on tonight is um, is uh, artificial insemination of the honeybee, and I guess the proper terminology is instrumental insemination. Um, it's real semen, nothing artificial, I guess. Uh, it's the real thing. So, um, and when I first let's see, I went to Purdue must have been two years ago. Um, uh, Crispin uh, Gibbon. Um, is a very well-known um, instrumental insemination kind of guru out there at Purdue. And he puts on a workshop every year. And there was probably 10 of us in that, work, in that workshop. And um, he kind of took us through the whole realm of uh, getting things ready, um, harvesting the semen from the drones and um, inseminating the queens. And then we got to bring our queens home. And mine did die, but... Um, <laughs> It's a learning curve. It's definitely a learning curve to get through. Has anybody here done instrumental insemination? Anybody else? It, it's a, uh, and I, as I go through this, I think you're going to see, I have not stepped up to do it yet because um, it, it's technically demanding, but there's a lot more to it than the technical part of it, I guess. And that's kind of what I want to touch upon today. I mean, the main reason for instrumental insemination is it's mainly about, um, selective breeding you know and uh, i breed belgian draft horses and belgian draft horses you know it's a very subjective thing that we're looking for confirmation wise and and the way they move and and i can select individuals to try to to exploit their genetics and that's the reason for instrumental insemination it's to uh it's to exploit the the, tr the good genetics and the things that we're looking for in honeybees is you know like mite control and that's one of the big things that um, out at Purdue, that's their big push is for um, the ankle biters and the, and the uh, to get rid of the varroa. And it's really interesting if you look at their data, how much they have uh, genetically selected for the destruction of the, the varroa mite. Um, we can look at overwintering, especially up here in the north and the hives that live through the winter. You know, which ones do we want to keep around? Temperament, huge. It, you know, when I look at like new beekeepers, I would say temperament's got to be at the top of the list. I mean, nobody wants a mean, mean hive. Um, and then honey production. Some of us are here <laughs> to get the max amount of honey. So again, I think when you venture into instrumental insemination, it has to be for a reason. Um, and the part, I guess, that bothered me the most with this is, again, these are very subjective things. And I was really looking for something hardcore to measure, I guess, to know that if I'm going to go through all this work, and I'm gonna go through all this expense. I wanna be able to see at the end that I've produced something that's more superior and that I can charge more for when you're done at the other end. And I think that's the hard part that I'm finding. Um, again, the, the tool, the goal is to uh, control the random mating. Again, when a queen leaves your hive, um, she goes off and she randomly mates with 15 to 20 drones of unknown origin. Typically those drones are nowhere as close 
None of us live on an island where we can totally isolate our drone population. And it's the drone population is almost forgotten about. You know, it's we just kind of think of it as this abyss. And, and that is probably the biggest thing that the instrumental insemination does is it takes over that part of the that we don't know. So you need a clear objection of what you're going to do. Again, there's increased costs, a lot of work involved, and it's very timely. Um, again, getting your drones to come up at the same time as your queens to inseminate. Um, so I, again, uh, me being this more science oriented, I'd love to have something more measurable, but very, very difficult. Uh, and the thing that really kind of got me the most was when, when Dr. Uh, Gibbons was like, to properly select, you need a hundred hives. Oh. Yeah, I, that really blew me away. Like, well, shit, how am I going to do? A, I don't have a hundred hives. Like, but you know, you start to think about it a little bit. You know, when you first got started and you had one hive, you didn't really know what that one hive was doing unless you had two hives. Then you get two hives, and then you start to see a difference between you know the the good hive and the bad hive. And then you get five, and then you can start to sort out more of the superior genetics and. You know, and it goes back to my days as growing up as a kid. I remember when the bull studs, I grew up in a dairy farm and you could never prove a sire, a bull, unless she had over a hundred daughters. Um, it takes a lot of numbers to start to see genetic selection. And so that was the first thing that probably when it hit me, it was like, you know, it's like, you probably need a hundred hives before you're gonna be able to select the superior um, animal, superior bug. And uh, so that's when it got, kind of got my mind thinking. And again, I think that may be something in a, in a club atmosphere that might be very beneficial. But the big question is, can 20 or, you know, or 10 or five people properly evaluate their hives to select the superior hives that they want to replicate? Um, and again, that's what you get into as far as, you know, keeping that data and recording it and making sure that my measurements look like Kim's measurements and, and trying to come up with some subjective way of, of, of selecting that superior um, queen or hive. Um, and the thing is, is we're not selecting for an individual, we're selecting for this super um, colony. Um, so it's all about selection. And to me, that's what really kind of hit me. You know, I think the, the instrumental insemination part is very doable, it's very, it's fun, it's technically challenging, and it's really cool. But this to me was the real stumbling block, is the selection process. If I'm gonna go through all this work and expense, I wanna know that when I get done doing this after five to 10 years, that I've really created a superior bee that I can sell for 300 bucks versus 35 bucks. You know, and if I can't demonstrate that, then I'm really just kind of spinning my wheels. And I think that's what kind of hit me so again, criteria, um, selection, you know, disease-free was the one that Purdue jumped on. And when you do this, you probably don't want to select for a lot of traits. You really want to select for kind of just a very few traits. And then as you go through this, you can kind of expand your traits. But, you know, to me, I guess, if I was going to sell queens to new beekeepers, it would be temperament. I really want a very uh, easy going bee, gentle. Lots of honey and overwinter as well. Overwintering is a huge thing in this area. Um, since most of us are not sitting on 100 to 200 hives, I think that's where you get into this cooperative effort again in, in trying to develop um, a, a, a bee that you could do. And so some of the suggestions they talked about was developing these field sheets and you kind of make a, a field sheet up and you go to give one to Kim and you give one to Linda and Evelyn and you say, okay, I want you just to rank your hives down through and, and then add them up and the hives that have the highest numbers, those would be the hives that we would evaluate to select our, our superior genetics out of. The thing is, is if you do this, you almost got to do it kind of in the same day. Because if you're judging for temperament, if she does it when it's getting ready to storm, may not be a true reflection of the way that the hives are behaving versus when I'm doing it on a nice sunny day or or something like that. So trying to do this in some orderly fashion or maybe yes, crisscrossing and trying to come up with a way to, to select the superior genetics. So, so once we've done this, now that you've picked the best of the best, which I think is probably the hardest part for me is, so what do you do? How do you um, exploit these genetics? On the farm, 
when I'm breeding horses, I exploit them in a couple different ways. I ship out semen. So instead of a stallion being able to breed one mare at a time, I'm artificially collecting and shipping semen all over. I can genetically do embryo transfers with mares and exploit her genetics. So instead of one full year, she's given me 10. We can do the same thing in bees and exploit some genetics. And he kind of talks about the walkaway split. It is a way to select for superior genetics. It's very slow and you can only do about one at a time. So if you've got uh, 10 hives and you really like the one hive is doing really, really well in your, in your way you're evaluating, you could just do a walkaway split of that hive and wait till that grows up and then do another walkaway split. And you can expand the genetics of that one hive just with that simple task. Now, if you're doing walkaway splits to avoid swarming, then you've forgotten the selection process and you're just doing it just to propagate bees and, and go. The next step would be up and that would be grafting. Um, so you select a superior um, colony in your, in your apiary and you say, this is where I want my queens to come from. So you start grafting and exploiting the genetics of that queen. And we're doing that by um, 50%. So we've controlled 50% of the genetics. That's only half. And again, I guess if I was, again, when I look at breeding horses, if I bred my very best mare to, uh, as one horseman call it, a piece of shit, um, <laughs> as I ask, I'll never forget that terminology, um, then I'm probably not going to get as good at genetics unless I'm selecting on both sides, um, the, mare, the mare and the stallion side. So you can buy, um, so again, by grafting that's well. Another thing that's been done is you buy these breeding queens. And you'll, you've seen these advertised as different groups. These breeding queens are quite expensive. Again, they've gone through the selection process on both sides, and they've presented to you a superior queen of something. And I guess that's the, you know, like, what are you looking for? And what is she a superior queen in, in overwintering, on temperament, on mite control, and the thing is with her is it's not the breeding queen. Like she's not superwoman. The thing you want to do then is get her daughters. And then her daughters would then just populate your entire colony and you would you'd bring them up through there. Um, but it is a way. And again, to me, the thing is, is this open breeding. Again, the willy-nilly breeding that would occur. And that, that's going to happen at some point as you're doing the selection. But um, if you're going to spend that kind of money, it'd be nice to try to keep it a little more orderly. And then the, the, the third option is to do grafting and then do your instrumental insemination. And that controls the genetics on both sides. So you get rid of the willy-nilly um, multiple drone matings and select again, you put as much pressure on your drone selection as you do your queen selection. And right now we don't do any drone selection at all. <clears throat> so you can pick the best of both uh, both lines. And uh, the big difference again, and to me, I think when I look at instrumental insemination, again, the technique is unique and it's different, but this is the secret behind instrumental insemination. It is the drone selection. You can put as much pressure on your drone selection as you do your queens. So when you go through your yard or your hundred um, uh, colonies and you're picking out the very best of the best and the one gets the uh, gets the, uh, the queen selection from, say, this is my best uh, hive, and I'm going to graft my queens out of this colony, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my drones out of this colony. And so I'm bringing the very two best hives in my yard together, or I may be bringing the queens out of my yard and then the drones out of uh, the very best out of Chris's yard of the drones. And the way they do this is with drone um, comb. And you'll take this drone comb that's kind of drawn out with the big cells and you stick it in a very proliferative hive. And to make drone is very, very uh, consuming of resources. Drones do nothing. Drones do nothing but consume tremendous amount of resources. To get to put, you shouldn't put more than one drone comb in a hive because the amount of resources that it takes to, to court those drones through is tremendous. Drones are very, very weepy. Um, they are fed, they are nurtured. The hive has tremendous amount of responsibility in getting the drones to come. If you pull drones out of a hive, they'll only live about 30 minutes. Um, they need heat, 
um, and they need to really be cared for. They're totally unlike a queen. A queen is pretty tough. Um, the drones are pretty weepy. So you, you put your drone comb in. Yeah, Doug. Well, how, how would you know? How do you know which drone to select? The queen, you can tell because of what her daughters are doing. But so the drones, which you would pick the drones the same way you would pick your queens. So the hive that is doing the, you know, the best honey production or we're winning the best, I'm going to take those genetics. They're just as important. And I'm going to make the other half of the equation. I'm going to make my drones out of that. And so the selection for the drones is the same selection that we're using on the queens. Um, it's, and again, it's not on individuals, it's on this super colony, this, this whole mass um, body of bees working together. You really don't know what your drone is doing until... Well, that drone though is, is coming from that queen. That queen is supplying all the genetics to that. It's a haploid, so that... Um, that drone is actually a copy of that queen. She's, he's very closely related to that queen. Okay. Um, there's, no, uh, there's no other half to it. He's very uh, genetically similar to her, um, very close. And so once you put this drone comb in and uh, it, takes a, it takes 40 days is what the kind of the common denominator is. So from the time I put that comb in and the queen starts laying eggs, it's going to take uh, 24 days for that, that to emerge. And then it takes another two weeks for those drones to be sexually mature so you can, can harvest the, uh, the semen from them. And what a lot of, there's different ways to select these drones. Um, some people use um, drone nursery colonies. And so when they, uh, when they stick the um, drone comb in their, their selected hive, once they've got them, the queen has got them laid and, and capped, They'll pull that out and then they'll set it into a nursery hive, a hive that's going to just nurture these drones and bring them along. Many times they'll seal the hive up. Um, they'll put the drones up in the, um, the top box with a queen excluder so they can't get out. And then they put a flight box on top of it to keep them trapped in there. Um, some individuals will just, uh, when the drones are um, coming emerging, they'll be emerging at a very certain time. As soon as they emerge, they, they keep them trapped in an upper box with a queen excluder. And then they go in there on a daily basis and they mark them with these yellow or red dots. You're gonna get some drift of drones coming into that, but if you mark them as, um, as young as they're emerging, mark them and then you could release them. And then they gotta sit for two weeks and let them get nourished and get them sexually mature. And then you would collect them as they fly back in. Most of the time what they'll do is put um, a queen excluder in the entrance so when the drones go out to fly, they usually leave, you know, late or early afternoon, and they're usually coming back by two or three o'clock. So a lot of times you can harvest your mature drones when they're flying back. The ones that weren't successful in finding queen, um, those are ones that you can harvest then. And then you can um, collect them like the night before and collect their semen. And the semen that they have will last quite a while. Um, it'll last at room temperature. It's pretty stable. Um, so you can get all your collections on the day before. But again, the big thing is the amount of resources it takes to develop drones and the timetable. Like it takes a long time for a drone to get sexually mature. And when we did it out there, the first, uh, we were collecting our drones, the first set of drones we got were all sexually mature. And they were very difficult to express until the next day they came in with some mature drones. And that was much easier than to, to harvest. Um, so when the selection process is complete, um, so you've done your selection, you've picked your very best hives to produce your queens, you've picked your very best uh, hives to produce your drones, and then everything is ready. The queens, they will emerge and they have to be held in their nukes or in um, queen banks um, for at least five to seven days to let them sexually mature so they can accept the semen. Um, if you're going to let them mature in nukes, you're going to have to put queen excluders in the front entrance so they don't leave um, and let them mate at large because um, you're going to want to keep them in. And some of those virgin queens are kind of small and they may be hard to keep in that, in that hive. Um, so a lot of times they'll be banked in little cages in a hive that um, doesn't have a queen and the work bees will nurture them and keep them going. Um, the drones will reach sexual maturity, like I said, about two weeks after they emerge. Um, and it'll take about uh, eight to 10 microliters, which is not a lot of semen, 
but that's typically about eight to 10 sexually mature drones. So it'll take at least 10 drones to get enough to, to inseminate one queen. Most of the time, if you're doing it, you're probably gonna inseminate you know, a handful of queens. So you may need 40 or 50 or if you find, run into a bunch of sexually immature ones, you may need a hundred drones or so before you're gonna get enough semen um, to get, it, get her all the queens inseminated. So this here is a picture of a, an everted um, drone. And when you, uh, so to, um, to collect the semen, you, um, you pinch the, uh, the head first and you kind of smash the head in the thorax and then you just kind of milk your fingers back and it just totally causes the uh, um, erection or ejaculation and then total inversion. And the semen is sitting right on the, on the tip of that. It's this, uh, just this kind of a cream color. The pure white is mucus. And this is the, I, I would think this is the most difficult part of this whole process to me is um, you just gotta suck off just the sperm. If you get the mucus in there, it is a disaster. It plugs up your, your capillary tube um, and you gotta be really careful because you gotta keep everything sterile because um, you don't wanna touch anything with your fingers. Um, because you'll infect your queen and, and she'll be and she'll be dead. So um, and now here's a little video, I believe, of uh, and I kind of got this. It was I harvested this off YouTube, and it has this really nice British accent. It sounds like you're in a Disney movie or something. Here, so, oh boy, no sorry. Yeah. Rolling and pressure on the thorax and abdomen affect the first phase of immersion of the copulative organ. Further pressure results in complete immersion and ejaculation. Mature sperm is cream colored and marbled in appearance. As here, it often covers the white mucus plug of the endothelus. Using the glass tip of the insemination syringe, merely touch the surface of the semen covering. In aspirating the sperm, none of the mucus should be allowed to penetrate into the syringe, thus preventing the cannula from becoming obstructed by a mucus plug. Similar to the natural mating process, the semen of several drones is aspirated in portions. A minimum of eight microliters are required for insemination. This corresponds to the quantity of semen donated by eight to ten mature drones. If necessary, the tip of the cannula is cleaned off with a sterile swab. A drop of diluent flows into the capillary to prevent the semen from desiccation. Now the syringe is ready for insemination. So when we would do this and you watched her as she did it, is you would bring the, the capillary tube on top of the endothalamus to suck it up. You would put a drop of like old semen on it and then that would help suck it up and pull it off. But um, I was always sucking up mucus and it was, uh, it takes a very uh, slow process. You don't wanna be in any sort of hurry, but once you got the hang of it and stuff, then you could really start to see the difference and, and pull it off of there. But um, we would go through um, again, um, the drones don't live very long. So by the time we would load up with drones and stuff, and um, it takes, it'll take a good hour to get everybody taken care of and stuff. But once you get it up in the capillary tube, it's good. And we would just store it in um, a dark place overnight or um, it stays very, very, um, it's pretty tough stuff. And actually you can see it. Um, uh, you'll see people that sell it and you can buy it. I've seen it on different people's websites where you can buy the semen from their drones and stuff, which again would be a very viable. Again, it'd be interesting to know what, what is the selection process? You know, what are you selecting for? So the semen is again very stable. It can be collected like the morning or the day before the insemination. You store it in a dark location at room temperature. And again, you can ship it and um, share the genetics uh, 
with other beekeepers or other people that you know in the state. And, and again, I think this is an area that could really be, um, could really be exploited a little bit, I think. And uh, um, again, this is a, a difficult part of this whole process. And if somebody would facilitate this, I definitely think there would be a market for it. Now you do the insemination of the queen. So now you've got your semen and this is the process of insemination. And they instinctively will back up. So they, they put them in this tube and, um, and then they instinctively back up into this uh, thing, the chamber that they're going to sedate them in. And you just did so many bubbles per minute or per second. It was pretty a general anesthetic. It was not real technical. <laughs> the ventral hook jet engages behind the ventral plate of the last segment. The dorsal or sting hook, in this case, a perforated hook, exposes the sting chamber. The sting lancets and epidermal bones are now visible. So it's important to pull that stinger back. Right there. The syringe is adjusted in the direction of the vaginal bulge and the droplet of diamond removed. The vaginal orifice is only exposed in techniques which lift up the sting apparatus. The syringe could therefore be inserted without the use of a vaginal probe and the semen is injected directly. And it was amazing how much you could put in them. Like it would take, it seemed like a lot. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> you blow her out of it. So you, you, they mentioned in this as well that they said they had um, they had sedated her the day before. So you can sedate them the day before or the day after. And most of them that I know will sedate them the day after. So you breed your queen, um, you let her go back into the um, the queen bank and let her be taken care of by the workers. And then you bring her back out at 24 hours later and you knock her out again. And what we would do is just put the uh, queen cages in like a, a big gallon pickle jar or whatever, kind of put a hole in it and just fill the whole jar with carbon dioxide and just gas them all down. And the second gassing just helps them sexually mature for some unknown reason. And they start laying eggs quicker. Um, they'll start laying eggs around day three. If we let them do it naturally, it takes a lot longer for the process to kick in. So I don't know who came up with that. It was probably some error, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, if you knock them out twice, um, you know, they, they uh, start laying quicker. So uh, that is a procedure. Sent. So you could knock them out the day before you inseminate them or knock them out the day after. And um, it was interesting too. When we did our queens, they would, um, the one thing that's, that's nice about artificial insemination or the instrumental insemination is you can also pick your very best queens. And they were very picky about their queens. They wanted the big, the biggest queens you could get. And one of the things that they selected for in their queens was their legs. If this queen came out of the, her cage and they would put them on a glass window because they instinctively would go through the light. So they'd let them go and the queens would launch up on this window and they would watch them crawl up this window. And if they had legs that looked like a big spider, 
those were your best queens. Those were your most prolific queens. Uh, the queens that were kind of spindly or they had a hurt leg or something wasn't proper, they never inseminated them. So the queens went through a, like a selection process. And when they were on that window, there was one task was supposed, they were supposed to defecate because the last thing you want happening is where you're in some of your queen, she ends poops on your, on your surgery table. And, uh, and then you kind of contaminate everything. So we would let the queens go out on the glass. Um, we would kind of do a selection process there. And then we take this little collection tube and you just get it in front of them and you kind of just shove them in the tube and hold it with your fingers. And they would instinctively back up into that other chamber then as you gas them down. And uh, in, in that part of it, actually, I was, it, it wasn't as difficult as um, I thought is the, the drone collection. Um, and then when you inseminate them, this was the, the interesting thing to understand. So as you saw them drawing that, that pipette down, they go right in this vulvar fold. But the interesting thing is it's not a straight shot down. There's this little fold right there. And you kind of had to work your, um, so when you brought your pipette down, you had to kind of bring it in and kind of push it back and then let it go back to get around this little fold. And so you kind of had to maneuver your way in. Once you got into the right spot, you knew it because then um, you wouldn't see any uh, semen backflow out. It would take it all. And if you notice, it's filling up the oviducts. And so, you know, you would think you'd be filling up, you're not filling up the spermatheca. That, they actually runs into there after you fill the oviducts up. So the oviducts are flooded. And then I think kind of what happens, because it, if the drone would fill up the spermatheca, then that would not allow the genetic selection that comes. So after she gets done meeting with, meeting with eight or 10 or 12, this is kind of a blending area in the oviducts where the semen is mixed and then it can all kind of go into the spermatheca as a, um, a selection process. And so you're not getting all of one drone in one thing. The whole idea of it kind of interesting with the anatomy of the queen is for, so that you don't get a devastating uh, failure with just one drone and one queen. There's a lot of genetic diversity that protects the hive from the catastrophe. And, and it's interesting to look at the anatomy and, and the different things that help advocate that. Is that Yeah, and that's where the semen will stay for her entire life then, isn't that spermatheca? And that's what she controls when she fertilizes and, you know, lays a fertilized egg or an unfertilized is by letting the, the semen out. And I think that's got to be like tremendously. Can you, I just can't imagine the intricacy, the, the, uh, how carefully she's got to be able to do that to just say, okay, I'm going to lay an unfertilized egg here and a fertilized one here. Well, how does she, that little trap door has got to be pretty small. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand the mechanics, but it's um, definitely very, very interesting. Looks to me like some pretty extensive equipment. I got a slide in here. Yeah. That'll, that'll talk a little bit about that and stuff. So after insemination, a lot of these queens are not just marked with a yellow or blue dot. They're usually, they put a number on them because you want to specifically know what queen this was. And if something went wrong during the procedure or went right, at least you can kind of mark it down. And again, they're held for 24 hours and then sedated again with carbon dioxide. That speeds up the maturation process. Um, you know, some people like to, to mature their queens in a nucleus. And it does appear that those queens will be accepted back into the nucleus much quicker than if you're in with like a, a queen bank, but the queen bank is just really efficient. Um, and it's a lot easier to get in and get out of and stuff. So when you do put that inseminated queen back in that, in her mating nuke, well, it's not a main nuke anymore, it's just her nucleus. Um, you wanna probably uh, put a queen excluder on the, on the front of it, just to not allow her to go out there and start laying or get mate again and um, also to keep her in the hive. Um, the queens will lay and have duration as long as any natural. So and a lot of people would speculate, well, they won't, but they will, they will do three years, four years. Um, they get just as much semen as a naturally mated uh, queen and do very, very well. Does a naturally mated queen ever leave the hive to go in some Yeah, she, um, she may leave two or three times to mate. So again, I don't know what the, I don't know what shuts off that mating urge, I guess you could say, 
And the concern is that if you put her back in there, will she have some tendency to want to go out there and mate yet in the wild and stuff? So as long as she starts laying and stuff, then she'll get too heavy to, to fly. Uh, so things to con uh, consider when moving forward with it is, you know, do you feel comfortable with the selection process? I think that is a huge part of this whole deal. Um, technically demanding, um, the time dedication again, um, and they, this was emphasized quite a bit. Again, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this besides just the instrumental insemination. It's collecting the drones and the queens. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And uh, again, like um, Doug brought up the increased cost. Um, Apis Engineering is actually the company that uh, um, Dr. Gibbons kind of works with. And his complete queen system is uh, $43.99 this year. Um, and it is a complete system. It's uh, it has the carbon dioxide, the mono, the, this is a dissecting microscope with the holders and everything that's in it. It's a, it's a top of the line. It's a very nice machine and stuff and does well. But again, I think to do this, you got to justify the ability to sell queens at a higher price. And how do I can market that to you or Chris and stuff and say, hey, my queen is much more superior than your queens and stuff. And, and that, to me, that's the hard part. So what are your thoughts, questions? Uh, Evelyn. Um, she's gonna have, you're selecting her daughters for your stock. How long will those traits carry on? Not so like if you, oh, I mean like get a, yeah. So if you get a breeder queen, what are, I think they say like after six, um, six crosses, it's totally gone. So like she makes a daughter and then they split and they make a daughter. Um, within two years, it could probably be, the genetics could almost be gone. And what kind of what I, what you see a lot of them do is they'll, they'll get like a breeder queen every year and they'll kind of rotate back and forth. Um, and usually they have two like apiaries and they'll use a breeder queen and try to populate that entire hive with her daughters and then get another one the next year and try to populate another. Um, again, you're just looking at general. And it depends on who's next to you, who your neighbors are. You know, and a lot of times you'll hear big, um, I know you talked to uh, your, what's the lady down there, Linda, in the Columbus? Yeah. Nina. Nina. Oh, Nina. Yeah. I mean, she will um, bribe or give good hives to a lot of her neighbors just so she's got good quality drones around her um, and stuff. So. Um, again, trying to get a good population, if you got a, it's, it is definitely hard to control, unless you live on an island, it's hard to keep the genetics very clean. Yeah. Um, I know a couple of years ago, we were going for like $400. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I've seen prices, I've seen them up to like $1,200, you know, and, and stuff for breeder queens. And, and again, I guess, you know, like. Has anybody here, I think Angel had a couple breeder queens. Yeah, Has sure anybody else that. ventured into the breeder queens at all? Yeah, I haven't. And it died. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of marketing in that. I like, I, I just don't know. You know, I, again, I think the hardest part is to say that my queen is going to be much better than, you know, Joe Schmo's queen that just openly made it and stuff. So. I think that's been that's been the difficult sell for me right now. I can't. I really want to be able to see what I'm doing if I'm doing it. Any other thoughts, Becky? Last two years, uh, we bought another gentleman who did the uh, internal insemination. Uh, very gentle. Yep. No problem. Uh, but we lost. So, so if you, yeah, if your selection process is really narrow, um, it can be, again, if I'm just going to select for really kind, you know, temperamented bees, um, but they got to live through the winter, you know, that is the truth, yeah, yeah. All righty, I don't, that's um, all I got for my, my presentation. Any other, um, I don't think we have any further business except the... You got anything over there yet? Uh, door, prizes. door prizes? There we go.